Hello, I'm Roger Sutton. I'm Chief Executive of CERA. We've now come to the end of the land zoning decisions we started making in 2011. Those early decisions were about the flat land. These videos today are about the final decisions we've made regarding the Port Hills. We've put together a series of videos with Dr Keith Turner. Keith Turner was the person who's led the review panel's work and he's going to talk about the review panel's recommendations that have been used in making these Port Hills decisions. For some people, these videos won't be enough, they'll want more information. And to answer those questions, we're organising a, session, um, a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, public meetings, where we can come along and get more detailed information about particular issues affecting their area. I know this has been a very lengthy process and it's been very, very stressful for a lot of people. But we wanted to make these decisions um, correctly. We wanted to consider all the information people gave us. We wanted to consider all the information all the geotech experts had been through. We've taken every care we can to try and make sure these decisions are correct and these decisions will therefore give people confidence to carry on living in their houses or if necessary to decide to take up our red zone offer. If you have any further questions, having seen this video or reading your information packs, you can ring us at 0800 ring Sarah or send us an email at info at sarah.govt.nz. My name's Keith Turner and I'd like to explain for you a little bit about what the Port Hills Review Panel uh, have gone through in reviewing the red zoning in that area. Right from the outset, we knew we were tackling a very important task. A task where we had been given criteria by the government and we had to apply them consistently, practically, carefully, and to be reasonable in our judgments. We knew we were making decisions about people's lives about people's homes and the places that they have deep feelings for. I can personally understand how deep some people's feelings may be. I have built my own home and lived in it for 32 years and had very strong emotions for that property. However, I just can't imagine the reaction that many of you must have had to the earthquake and the red zoning. So we took a great deal of care, knowing the responsibilities that had been placed upon us. <clears throat> when we went about this task, we considered each properly, property very carefully. It was very important for me that the whole panel understood not just the technical issues with each property, but actually understood what they looked like and where they were. So the way we tackled the job was to go out and on the first day of a week-long ex exercise, we spent looking around all of the areas that we were going to consider. Following that field visit, we spent three or four days in the office going through masses of data, and we had a lot of data available to us. We had modelling results from GNS called 2D modelling. We had some additional 3D modelling information. We had a lot of ground mapping. We had a lot of crack mapping that was available to us. We had a whole host of GNS reports that were absolutely extensive. I think they would, have, if they'd been piled up, they'd have been at least a foot thick. We had four specialist engineers in the room while we did these considerations. A specialist engineer from GNS, deeply involved in the modelling. We had an engineer from the City Council who had been involved in the Section 124 work. We had a CIRA expert and we also had a, an additional uh, consultant advising CIRA. On top of all of that, we also had cliff collapse modelling and we had the ground truthing that had been undertaken by field crews who had gone out into the field to correlate what the the modelling had said with actual field conditions. 
So we had a great deal of data, far more than we can present to you in the, the results of this review. At the end of our work, after a week of considering the uh, technical material and having made our preliminary decisions, we went back out into the field and spent nearly a day verifying on the ground many of the decisions that we had made in the office. So it was an extensive exercise. What I can also say to you is in going through the technical data, you cannot just uplift the, the, the modeling, particularly the 2D modeling, and take it on its face value. You do have to interpret it, you have to understand how it has been done. In many places we found the modeling either underestimated or overestimated the risk. Particularly because in the way the modeling works, it does tend to average across an area. And when you look at the ground and look at the profile of rock roll, uh, even modeled, uh, sorry, even actual rock trajectories, it doesn't always match up with the modeling. Modeling's also a bit inaccurate at the extremities. Uh, numerical systems don't always work well when there's significant changes. And at the ends of each of the modeling areas, there's a lot of need for interpretation. The same can be said about cliff collapse. The cliff collapse modeling gives an idea of where the cliffs might uh, project out to. But in many cases, field observation showed material going further than the model represented. And, and also, in many places, the cliff collapse model did not pick up, pick up the profile of the land as accurately as it needed to. So we had to interpret uh, around cliff collapse as well. Finally, I want to say a little bit about the driving criteria. The Cabinet had approved our work to be done on the basis of immediate risk to life. And they quantified that risk as immediate risk to life of 1 in 10,000 chances in 2016. It was done for 2016 to get past the, all of the earthquake settling, all of the myriad of small earthquakes that are settling down after this big one. And what does it really mean? What does 1 in 10,000 risk to life really mean? Well, there are three major uncertainties. One is, what's the chance of an event, another big earthquake happening? Secondly, if you do have another big earthquake, what's the chance of boulders rolling down the hill, being released from a source up the top of the hill and rolling down the hill? And thirdly, what's the chance the boulder will hit a person? And I guess it's that last point that's most important. And the way in which the risk was defined was to assume that in any spot where the risk model was run, there may be a person present for something like 16 hours a day. So that might apply to a dwelling. Uh, and that's absolutely fundamental to the way in which we looked at risk. So I hope you can understand a little bit about the complexity of what we had to do. And we did our very best to recognise immediate risk to life and, and to confirm and add to the zoning decisions that we started with. We're looking at map one called Bowen Vale and we're particularly interested in the area around Rockcrest Lane. The risk arises in this area from rock roll. Uh, the blue line represents the risk to life criteria and the sources of rock lie up in this area here. The panel took great interest in the uh, modelling for risk and was satisfied that the model was a fair representation of the risk and that properties within the risk area, particularly these properties here, uh, should be red zoned and recommended that they be red zoned. 
On the western side, there's also a, another area of rock roll risk that affects just a couple of properties in this location. So that's Map 1 Bowen Vale. So we're looking at map two called uh, Woodlow Rise, and this covers uh, area of uh, Centaurus Road, uh, Whaka Terrace, and Woodlow Rise itself. And the the risk of interest here was really to do with rock roll, uh, predominantly on uh, council land, but none of the rock roll profile affected any dwellings. The rocky outcrops are, are in this area here. The risk profile does not extend into any dwelling area. And although we found some isolated pockets of cracking, we did not consider them to have any impact on uh, risk to life. That covers Woodlow Rise. We're looking at map three called uh, Centaurus Road, and we're looking particularly in the area of Centaurus Road and View Terrace. Uh, there's a, a man-made quarry uh, in this area, and it's a crescent shaped, and the risk we're particularly interested in is the risk of the quarry face uh, collapsing. In this particular area, the modelling of the quarry face is very good where the face is high, but at the extremities the face declines down to wither away to a slope, so the risk at either end of that uh, slope is uh, considered to be overstated by the model, but in the centre of the crescent the risk of collapse is considered to, to be significant. So that covers map 3 Centaurus Road. We're looking at map 4 called Rapaki Road and in this area uh, it's bounded largely by Rapaki Road and Vernon Terrace and the issue we have uh, of concern here is to do with rock roll. We found that properties are at risk to rock roll and there are quite a number of rocky outcrops in this area, you can see the risk profile being mapped. Uh, there was some isolated pockets of ground cracking, but the ground cracking was not considered to be a risk to life. So that covers map 4 Rapaki Road. We're looking at map 5 called Stronsi, and map 5 covers the area of Lucas Lane to the west and through to Port Hills Road on the east. Now in this area we have quite complex uh, risks. In the blue here we have got risk from rock roll. In the centre here we have a combination of risk from rock roll and also risk from a cliff with some man-made elements to it. Uh, in this area we have a man-made quarry with some rock roll risk over here and over on the eastern side we have a combination of both rock roll risk in the blue and a small cliff uh, in the yellow. And in this area here in particular we found that with both expert advice and uh, careful uh, examination of the risk profile uh, this risk in the to rock roll was uh, overstated largely because there's considerable flat land uh, below the cliff and the effect of rocks on flat land is to dim diminish uh, the distance that they will roll. So this area we considered the rock roll risk to be overstated. So that covers map 5 Stronzi. We're looking at uh, map 6 uh, called Port Hills Road 
and it's in the area bounded by Avoca Valley Road and Port Hills Road. This area is largely affected by rock roll. Uh, you can see the outline of the risk profile in blue. Uh, most important to recognise that the rock sources are quite high up in this area and they're not observable from Avoca Valley Road or from Port Hills Road. There are some significant modelling uncertainties in this area and in particularly around here and the panel did have to uh, make some judgments to achieve sensible outcomes in this area. We were very interested in this area and we actually spent quite a lot of time when we visited to make sure that our experience in the field matched up with the modelling analysis and particularly to recognise that the area of Avoca Valley Road creates quite a large bench so that any rocks that are coming down in this direction uh, will be running out on relatively flat land in their lower runout area and the effect of Avoca Valley Road is to overstate the risk to rock roll in this area on the eastern side of Avoca Valley Road. So that's Map 6, Port Hills Road. We're looking at Map 7 uh, called Avoca Valley and it's bounded by the upper valley part of Avoca Valley Road. This area, the particular risks of concern to the panel were rock roll, uh, rock sources uh, in this area, uh, some are quite concentrated and there's uh, been some very specialist investigation to uh, validate the modelling work for the rock runout area in this area. In the, this area the valley flattens off a little so the risk profile does tend to change. Uh, but there's also been a very extensive boulder mapping to verify actual uh, boulder runout lengths against the model. So that's Map 7 of Oka Valley. So we're looking at Map 8 uh, called Horatani Valley and it's in the area at the uh, end of the Horatani Valley Road. In this area the uh, risk uh, that the panel was considering uh, was to do with rock roll. Uh, the rock roll direction in this part of the map is coming uh, from the west while in this part of the map is coming from the south. So there's two directions for rock roll and some topographical effects in this area affecting the way the boulders will roll. There's been quite a lot of validation of the risk profile in this um, area undertaken by quite detailed uh, rock roll mapping. So that's Map 8, uh, Horatani Valley. We're looking at Map 9 called Bridal Path Road number 1. And it's in an area bounded by Bridal Path Road and the tunnel, tunnel road up to the northern tunnel portal. This is an area that's exposed to uh, rock roll. Uh, the rock roll risk in the tunnel road area, just in this area, was considered to be quite overstated, largely because of the benching effect of the the tunnel road, it's quite a wide road and uh, it would absorb uh, the energy of any boulders coming down. So this area we considered the risk to be considerably overstated. And then over on this uh, eastern side, the sources of rock for the eastern side are in this area. Uh, but there's no rock sources in here, so the risk profile does come to a reasonably abrupt uh, end. These uh, rock roll risk areas here are just localised rock roll risk from localised uh, boulder sources. So that's map 9, Bridal Path Road number 
We're looking at map 10 called Morgan's Valley, and it's in the area of the, at the, at the head of Morgan's Valley. Uh, this is an area where the particular risk is driven by rock roll or boulder roll. Uh, there's some very strong concentrations of rock around the head of this valley. Uh, particularly in this area, many people will have uh, recalled there was large quantities of rock released and very detailed mapping showed uh, a large number of boulders uh, were spawned by that uh, uh, high rock source collapsing. There's uh, some particular areas that we had to consider in great depth and we actually made several uh, field visits to this area to satisfy ourselves on our conclusions, particularly this area here where the benching effect of the road uh, overstates the risk in just a localised area. Uh, and in this area here, uh, we looked at that in great detail and we got some expert advice uh, on how the model was generating this uh, profile. Uh, it became quite clear from our advice and our consideration in the field that this is a, an anomaly in the model and uh, we should uh, make some sensible decisions in this area rather than following the model exactly. So that's map 10, Morgan's Valley. This is map 11, Bridal Path Road number 2, and it's bordered by Martindale's Road, uh, Bridal Path Road and Hamilton Lane. The particular risk of concern in this area is uh, rock roll. Uh, there's some very steep bluffs in this area here that uh, provided sources of rock. And in fact, a number of houses uh, in this locality were hit by boulders and some 2,000 boulders were mapped in this particular area. So that's map 11, Bridal Path Road number two. We're looking at map 12 uh, called Bridal Path Road number 3 and this is in the area of Hamilton Lane and to the north along Bridal Path Road. Again this uh, is an area of uh, rock roll risk, uh, some very strong rock roll sources in, uh, in this area where, with the, the sources of rock diminishing as you, as you move northwards. Uh, the area of Bridal Path Road, this Bridal Path Road provides a considerable benching effect for, for the relatively few sources in this area. So the panel did consider the risk profile to be overstated uh, in this area of the map. And this unusual shaped U is a modelling artefact which uh, is not present in the actual risk profile. So the, the panel considered that the risk profile ran largely uh, straight through cleanly. So that's map 12, Bridal Path Road, number three. We're looking at map 13, uh, Mount Pleasant, and there's two distinct areas here, one in the area of uh, Quarry Road, and the other in the area of Aratoro uh, Place. Uh, in the area of Quarry Road, uh, two distinct phenomena. Let's take the cliff collapse area first. Uh, in this area here we've got um, sea cut cliffs. Uh, you can see there's three lines on the map and each line represents a retreat zone. So the first line would represent the immediate life risk and the second and third lines may be subsequent retreats for subsequent disturbance or events. Uh, in this area here, uh, this is an area that's got very, very extensive uh, cracking mapped. Uh, the ground is clearly very unstable. Uh, the panel visited this area and looked at it in great detail. We were not allowed to visit the lower area because of the risk to failure and we considered that there was immediate risk to life in this particular area here. Over near Orotoro Place, uh, we have sea-cut cliffs again. Uh, these run um, 
north to south. At the northern end of the cliffs, they're quite low, and expert panel advisors considered that the, the risk as drawn on this map was a bit overstated. Uh, as you run further to the south, the cliff rises considerably, and the uh, risk to life from cliff collapse uh, increases quite significantly. So that's map 13, uh, Mount Pleasant. We're looking at map 14 called uh, Maffey's Road and particularly in the locality uh, bounded by Maffey's Road and McCormick's Bay Road. This is an area where the cliff collapse model did not identify uh, any particular risk because it's, it's steeply sloping land but some extensive geotechnical evaluation has shown that the, the slope in this area is uh, carrying significant cracks and is quite unstable. So this affects a localised risk to a property. So that's map 14, Maffey's Road. We're looking at map 15 uh, called uh, Virginia Lane and we're looking in the vicinity of Virginia Lane. Uh, this is an area where there's uh, a semicircular source of uh, rock boulders uh, in this area here. Um, relatively uh, small um, run out risk from the boulders here, although we do understand one boulder has been mapped a little outside this risk area. but uh, we've had expert technical advice review this area and we're confident that the risk profile is accurately represented by this blue risk, risk line. So that's map 15 Virginia Lane. We're looking at map 16 called Red, Red Cliffs number one and we're considering the area between McCormick's Bay Road and Main Road. In this area we have a number of features uh, to consider. On this area adjacent to McCormick's Bay Road we've got uh, a number of localised quarries. Uh, again you can see the three lines that represent three event retreat lines where the most immediate line represents the most immediate risk to life and the subsequent lines would come from subsequent events. These are smallish quarries. This is a much larger quarry. I think it was used to extract the rock for the causeway. And further to the north we've got a rock taken out to make room for McCormick's Bay Road. Around at the point you've got uh, again a small quarry and what appears to be a gap between the risk lines associated with the quarry on the western side of the point and the start of the Red Cliffs, Sea Cut Cliffs to the eastern side. We've had some very expert review of this particular area and we've been advised by the modellers and the experts that this is an, a risk anomaly and that the risk line should run right through from the quarry through into the Red Cliffs area. On the Red Cliffs uh, themselves, uh, quite an extensive cliff, a high cliff, well known to the locals, and of course an area where there was a large cliff face failure. Uh, this area uh, has quite high cliffs and uh, obviously considerable uh, rock profile uh, risk and at the top here in this area here uh, very extensive detailed uh, cracking mapping has been undertaken and real concern about the stability in this area the uh, rock cracking in this area does uh, present an immediate risk to life and Again, we've seen uh, 
the panel confirmed the zonings in this area. Subsequent to the panel's recommendations, uh, Cabinet has considered uh, the area of the school and has uh, already decided to align the uh, risk profile in the school area with the adjacent private properties. So that is a decision that has already been taken subsequent to the panel's recommendations. So that's map 16 of called Redcliffs 1. We're looking at map 17 uh, called Redcliffs number 2. And we have two areas to consider uh, on this map. The first area is in the vicinity of Rakura Place, uh, Egnot Heights and Defender Lane. And the other area is at the lower end of Monk's Spur Road. Now looking at the uh, Egnot Heights area, this is a continuation of the Red Cliffs uh, cliff area. Uh, steep cliffs, quite high. Uh, everyone will know about the extent of the inundation caused by part of the cliff collapse. Of particular interest though is the middle area here where the way in which the risk model for cliffs has been calculated, it has not followed the land topography at all accurately just in this zone. There's a, a narrow deep uh, gully that extends in or the cliff extends into that gully. So there is an anomaly in this uh, risk profile around the cliff collapse zone just in this particular area. Over at Monk Spur Road we have a, a small cliff uh, where we've had quite a lot of expert work undertaken on it. The risk profile from inundation is considered to be quite overstated for the yellow cliff area here. Uh, on the other hand, in this area here, there's a low cliff that's just below 10 metres. Uh, it didn't come up in the cliff modelling. The cliff modelling only looks at uh, cliffs above 10 metres. But the loess is quite a weak material and uh, geotechnic experts have done a lot of crack mapping in this area and consider this area to be quite unstable and uh, to present a real risk to life. So that represents uh, another area that's um, got uh, quite a lot of expert uh, review and geotechnical evaluation associated with it. So that's map 17, Redcliffs number two. So we're looking at map 18 called uh, Monks Bay. Three distinct, three distinct areas uh, to consider here uh, in Red Rock Lane, uh, Cliff Street, and then the uh, continuation of Main Road. Looking at Red Rock Lane, uh, some relatively minor and discontinuous uh, rock sources that create the risk of rock roll. Uh, they're, they're quite self-contained and we did not see any risk of life to any of the dwellings in this particular area. Uh, this uh, sea-cut cliff um, been subject to expert uh, analysis. Uh, it's a relatively small cliff. Uh, there's been no observed cracking. Uh, it appears to have been very stable throughout the uh, the repeated earthquakes, and so we considered that the uh, risk to life associated with the inundation profile, this yellow profile here, was overstated and we, we got expert opinion to confirm that for us. Uh, in the main road uh, Cliff Street area, uh, the uh, cliff collapse risk is uh, apparent here in the yellow. Uh, and again, this uh, has been subject to considerable expert analysis, and we believe the risk profile is properly set. Uh, in the centre area of this location, we've got 
combined uh, cliff collapse shown by the yellow and rock roll shown by the blue. Uh, this is an area that's again been subject to quite detailed analysis. Some of this area further to the north has been quarried and uh, that's um, to some extent uh, more stable than the, the natural sea cut cliff. But uh, that sea cut cliff uh, area has been carefully analysed for inundation risk. So those are the risks applying in this uh, particular area. So that's map 18 of Monks Bay. We're looking at map 19 called Kinsey Terrace. And this is an area bounded by Main Road, uh, Kinsey Terrace, Clifton Terrace, and I think the locals will know it well as uh, Peacock's Gallop. Uh, this area is uh, affected by serious cliff collapse. I think everyone will have seen the dramatic collapse of the cliffs in this area. Uh, they are quite high cliffs. And you can see from the map that the retreat lines here are quite a long way apart. And the inundation line is a long way away from the cliff face. Uh, this does represent a uh, very high risk of uh, risk to life from inundation for any of the collapse of this cliff area. Um, there's also two areas uh, adjacent that have uh, quite considerable uh, cracking mapping. Uh, this area here to the uh, western corner, uh, the land is exhibiting quite strong signs of cracking and instability. Uh, likewise, in this Clifton Terrace area, uh, extensive crack mapping has uh, demonstrated this ground is very unstable and uh, although it doesn't fall into either the rock roll or the cliff collapse uh, model characteristics the panel did conclude that this area had serious risk uh, to life. Across here in Clifton Bay the, the cliff is not quite as high I think reaching about 15 metres there is a distinct gap between uh, this area of the cliff, which tails down to steeply sloping land in this area. So that's why these cliff lines do not connect, and we did check to make sure that that wasn't an anomaly. Uh, we had that confirmed. Uh, but in this zone area, uh, in this zone here, we do have uh, up to 15 metres of cliff and a, an inunda inundation risk below it. So that's map 19, uh, Kinsey Terrace. We're looking at map 20 called Richmond Hill Road and it takes in an area around Nayland Street and also covers uh, the area between Richmond Hill Road and Wakefield Avenue. In this area we have uh, some sea cut cliffs with uh, a, an inundation zone allowed and the modelling here appears to be straightforward and quite accurate. Uh, in the Wakefield Avenue Richmond Hill Road area, again we've got rising uh, cliffs uh, rising to quite some height, around 110 metres at their highest. Uh, quite a bit of uh, land cracking and, and crack mapping in this whole uh, zone area. A great deal of attention given to the crack modelling. Uh, certainly, the cracking, some of the some of the cracking, has been established well back from retreat lines and in this area as well as at the uh, at near the highest points. Uh, however, having looked quite closely at uh, risk to life in this area, uh, the cliff is relatively low in this lower portion, and at the top. Of top end where the cracking does extend beyond the red zone, uh, the cliff face does move away from the residential property zones and leaves considerable margin for uh, events should they occur in the future before they impinge on any of the properties. So uh, we, although the crack mapping uh, did show up uh, some land instability, uh, we did, did not accept there's any immediate risk to life. Clearly because of the height of the cliff, uh, a real 
inundation uh, below that cliff and you can see the uh, inundation line extends well away from the cliff face itself along Wakefield Avenue. So that's map 20 Richmond Hill Road. We're looking at map 21 called Wakefield number 1 and this is in the area of Wakefield Avenue. At the northeastern end of the map uh, is the continuation of the Richmond Hill Cliff and uh, you can see the relatively wide inundation zone that uh, affects a number of uh, properties in that area. So uh, that's the phenomena we're dealing with there. Uh, further cliffs coming along as you go to the, uh, to the southwest, uh, but also uh, considerable uh, effect from rock roll as you go further southwest. So in this area here you have uh, some cliffs uh, and the inundation zones that spread onto Wakefield Avenue. Uh, Wakefield Avenue does create uh, a bit of a bench effect. Uh, as you go further southwest, a uh, combination of rock roll and, and cl these cliffs here also create a combined bench effect with Wakefield Avenue. So just in this locality, the panel gave quite a lot of consideration to this area. It uh, obtained expert advice uh, and some additional modelling from GNS and it concluded that the risk just at this end was probably a bit overstated. Uh, but as you went further southwest, uh, the concentration of rock sources for this rock roll became quite extreme. Uh, very strong uh, rock sources in this area. Uh, a lot of mapping of rocks that have come down. And although there's a cliff here that might you, you might think could form a bench, it presents more of a ski jump phenomena than a bench. And there was considerable rock mapping in this locality that showed that rocks were uh, propagating even across Wakefield Avenue. So uh, we were comfortable with the uh, approach to risk profile uh, set by uh, the rock roll perimeter uh, and also the fact that the, the cliff in this area probably wasn't going to impede uh, rocks as they, uh, as they came down the hill and that's certainly present in the evidence. So that's map, map 21, uh, Wakefield number one. We're looking at map 22 called Wakefield number two. It's in the uh, area at the top end of Wakefield Avenue and also Finsabi Place. In this area, we're principally concerned with rock roll risk uh, rock sources uh, high up on the, uh, the, the, the hills on this particular area. Uh, in, in this area here, Finsabi Place, uh, quite a lot of attention given to, uh, to, to this area because there was a large number of boulders mapped um, from uh, sources up on the hill. Uh, However, looking at the effect of the Finsabi Place benching uh, any rock roll, uh, we concluded that the risk profile in this area was slightly overstated. And so properties on the eastern side of Finsabi Place were not affected. We we'll also make the point that uh, in this area, uh, Boulder was released in February uh, after a long dry spell. Uh, it, uh, it came down and went through and uh, through a, a dwelling, uh, did substantial damage. Luckily, there was no one present at the time. But it's a great example of uh, how the, the, the earthquake has shaken loose uh, material up here and one doesn't really know when it may uh, come free. Uh, so uh, we found the, the detailed mapping of some 800 boulders in this area mapped very accurately the risk profile that the, uh, the risk model generated. So that's map 22, Wakefield number 2.